Welcome to Talks with Petri Show. I'm your host Petri, and today we have Mikko Revonniemi as our guest. Welcome, Mikko. Thank you for having me. How do you get Tim Ferris to endorse your product? That was actually partly luck. Oh, it was mainly luck, but it's a funny story in a way that when we started the company, we had a few major goals. Like and we, what we was the company? Hmm? Or what is the name of the company? Four Sigmatic. Uh, so we, early days when we started the company, we were thinking like, what are these major goals? If we reach these, we have succeeded. And one was that Tim Ferriss will endorse our products. So and you mean you funny. named Tim Ferriss? It was not like uh, someone famous. It was no, Tim it was, Ferriss. No, it was exactly Tim Ferriss. We had we had, we all had read the four hours a work week and you know Tim Ferriss at the time in 2010 he was a, I would say big name in an in a entrepreneur circle so we're thinking if he will endorse us we've made it and four years later roughly four years later he actually did it and we're like yes we did it and uh, it actually happened so that my colleague Mikael was doing calisthenics in Venice Beach with his friend and he always, we had this rule that always carry your own products. So he had some lion's mane uh, mushroom powder with him. And uh, he was doing the calisthenics with his friend. And uh, his friend was like, I know someone who knows someone uh, who knows Tim Ferriss. So if you can give me a few of those, I'll pass them to my friend and he'll pass them to Tim Ferriss because he most likely will find those interesting. And, and a few weeks later, he, uh, Tim Ferriss contacted us and asked if we want to uh, have him promote our products. He found them, especially the lion's mane extract, he found it really interesting. And obviously we were yes, because that was one of our main goals. And it was also a very funny story because everything before that moment was struggle for us. Like every single thing, trying to find new customers, trying to find retailers. Um, it was just struggle. We were in the brink of bankrupts almost every day. And when Tim Ferriss contacted us, we sold our US warehouse in a matter of one or two days. And um, Whole Foods Market, which we had been trying to contact many times, they have six different sales regions. And we, we've been calling them all like, hey, do you want to have our four Sigmatic products? And they're like, nah, we're not really interested in. And after Tim Ferriss mentioned us once in his, his podcast, the next day, Whole Foods Market start calling us. Hey, can we start stocking your products? It's like, yeah, sure, why not? But yeah, it was pure luck, like many of these things. Just nothing to do with, uh, well, it has a lot to do with persistence, but it was mainly the moment was just luck, good fortune. Yeah, but it was not just pure luck because you actually did something. You were thinking of it. You actually also put the chain in effect that you 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 knew someone who knew someone who knew someone, and you actually you know made it to happen. So it was not like that you did nothing. And yeah, and we were working hard for upon. years. We were yeah. working hard for four years. So that's like if you work hard, you get the luck eventually. Let's go back. So how did it all start? I understand it was your idea. You were walking in, in Shanghai, but how did you end up in Shanghai? And when did this happen? Uh, that was 2010. Um, prior to that, I've been working my father's company. Both of my parents been entrepreneurs. Um, mother when I was a, just toddler and father later on. So I've been working for his company and was planning to go to university to study business. and. And then there, there was this opportunity to go to Shanghai to work for um, FinPro, which is nowadays Business Finland, to promote Finland in the World Expo. And uh, I, was, I, I was thinking that that's very exciting on many levels. Um, first of all, before that, I, I've been thinking about learning a new language. And I was thinking, what could be the most difficult language to learn? And I was like, yeah, it's probably Chinese. And then there is this opportunity to go to Shanghai. And um, I sent an application and I got to interview, which was in English. And during the interview, the interviewer asked, like, do you speak any Chinese? I was like, no. Well, it's a requirement. Well, like, how hard can it be? And, and uh, um, the interviewer asked me, like, if we 
get you into Hagahelia in Helsinki. I was living in Tampere. If we get you to Helsinki for beginner's course, will you take it? I was like, of course I will take it. And then I traveled twice a week for four, three, four months to Helsinki to study Chinese. I took some summer course in Tampere as well. And then half a year later from the first interview, there was the second interview, which was in Chinese. And I sucked at it. I was really bad at it. Um, but fortunately, the one who interviewed me was the Chinese uh, teacher from Hagahelia. And he told me <laughs> that you weren't really that good, but given how much you have studied, you were really good. So I believe that once you get to Shanghai, you will learn what you need to learn. And I will recommend you. So I was the only one. There was 40 of us in our team, and I was the only one who hadn't been studied Chinese prior to that. And I thought when I was going to Shanghai that I can actually speak pretty good Chinese because of these two beginners class. And when I, when I got there, you know, I couldn't distinguish a single word when the locals were speaking. It was just long, kind of like a sound wave with no individual wordings. And I, I was like, God, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be screwed because at the work I need to be, speak Chinese. Um, but yeah, eventually it went good. I actually learned the language pretty well during those years. And, and during that one year, um, um, when I was working at FinPro, I, I, I basically kind of like shifted my um, these, uh, the shifts. I, I was shuffling my shifts so that I, I'm working long hours, long days, like two weeks in a row. And then the remaining time, I have like two or three weeks, uh, days off when I was traveling around China. And during these times, I, I noticed, well, actually noticed in Shanghai already that you have all these medicinal mushrooms and you have this Chinese traditional herbalism, all these things that are based on traditional Chinese medicine. And I found that really interesting because um, even before I went to China, all this health food, superfoods, uh, supplements and um, those were really close to my heart. I, I always wanted to, I played ice hockey before, so you know, I wanted to get maximal results with minimal, minimum effort. Didn't really work for my ice hockey career, but I learned a lot about uh, vitamins and um, supplements. So when I was in China, I, I noticed this, you know, say chaga mushrooms, reishi mushrooms and cordyceps mushrooms. And I was like, this is very interesting. I started studying herbalism in, from the perspective of Chinese traditional medicine. And I was like, I got to do something about this, especially with the um, medicinal mushrooms. There were a few companies at the time doing mushroom, medicinal mushrooms, but they weren't doing it that well. So I called my friend Tero, who is now running the company in the US that I think we should do something with the Chinese medicinal mushrooms. And, and original idea was to do like just regular capsules, just more affordably. You know, oh, there is already market. Let's, let's take a bigger share of that, just selling some capsules and supplements. And we start developing that brand a few weeks. Then we're like, no, let's not do this. Let's do something totally different. Like, you know, if we want to, if we believe that traditional Chinese medicine and these medicinal mushrooms are actually good for you, it's not enough that we can do another product that is exactly like everyone else's product. So there came the concept of let's make these beverages. Let's bring them closer to um, food and beverage instead of going to supplements. And uh, when, I, when I was working in, uh, in Shanghai and I had these long vacations, I, I traveled around China, I went to see the farmers, I went to see the um, uh, factories that can actually process them and, and, and trying to put together um, the whole supply chain. So once, because I knew the Shanghai um, job I had, it was one year project. So I knew it's gonna end. And originally, my plan was to go back to Finland and go to study. And then with this new idea, I was like, maybe I'm not going to do it. Maybe I'm, we're going to just have this company. I'm going to move to Hong Kong. We're going to set it up and I'm going to run it from there. And well, that's how we did it, like in late 2010, when the project ended and I had built the business, like written the business plan, which was, you know, the old type of 
what you would learn in school, like 40 pages, a lot of text, a lot of, you know, f- stuff you don't need. Um, but it was a good exercise, but yeah, I did it. And, and, and uh, since then I have learned, like, you can do that much better as well, but it was a good exercise. So anyway, into, uh, at, at the end of 2010, then I moved to, moved to Hong Kong and, um, with my backpack, with one luggage, um, and didn't know anyone there, but my only idea was to, you know, set the, set, set up the company and start doing the business with very little understanding how to do it or where to start. What about the hardest part in the beginning? Can you still remember, you know, about what happened? I understood that you, you, you find the cheapest hotels or motels and, and you didn't know, like you mentioned, you didn't know anyone. So how did you put it up and running? And the world was a different place. Was Shopify even existing at the time? It was after the financial crisis. So the world looked quite different than how, how it's nowadays. Yeah, it was, uh, there were many things that were difficult in the beginning. It was actually like, where do I start? I live in another country I, in, in, in a culture that I don't understand, uh, with no friends nearby, everything was new. So it's like, where do I even start? Like, how do I set up a company in Hong Kong? Where should I live? I like, when I moved to Hong Kong, it was, uh, 1 AM in the morning, I flew from Shanghai to Shenzhen. I took the cross-border bus to Hong Kong. It dropped, dropped me to TST, which is, you know, if you see any movies where the like, they, the like, shots from Hong Kong, and when you have all these neon light boards and that, that's TST. So I went to the cheapest hostel in Chungking Mansion, notorious Chungking Mansion, with all the prostitutes, all the drug dealers, and the cheapest hostels. And and I was sitting there like, okay, now I'm in Hong Kong. What now? What next? Like, what's going to happen now? And um, so so just to know what to do. And uh, back in the days, my my style of doing things was, I'm not asking anyone. I'll figure it out myself. So that was hard. Since then, I have learned like you can actually ask people. But in, in terms of business, I think the most difficult thing is um, for us that when you do fast move, uh, moving consumer goods, you actually need to ha- have a lot of capital to have the initial stock. Uh, we were also doing products that no one else were doing before. Um, we were doing in the industry that no one actually knew. It was sketchy for most people. Like there were times I remember we were laughing at this one, you know, again, Mikhail, uh, he was in Sweden. Um, I think it was 2011 or 2012 in a, in a, in a coffee shop, took some hot water and, and start, you know, um, using our own products there, like adding some cordyceps mushroom into water. And then the, the waitress comes like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just adding the mushroom, mushroom coffee here. Uh, and they're like, what mushroom get out. <laughs> You're not using trucks here. It's like, <laughs> so that was the level we were at. And it was really difficult to get people to um, accept the idea. And then obviously Shopify was brand new back then. We were using Shopify, but it wasn't as intuitive as it was now. Um, also, um, even though people bought products online, it wasn't as normal as it is nowadays. Um, so when you, when you sell mushrooms online, there, there are many things you can think that are actually pretty difficult. We, we had to kind of like, like let people understand, like, like build the trust basically. Like one thing, what we did, um, we were thinking, how can we build the trust? There were two things. One that we need to get a lot of reviews, a lot of testimonials on our side. So one thing what we did, there was like Mikael there and me, we had this friendly competition who will get the most amount of testimonials. And we end up getting, I think, 50, 40 or 50 testimonials from friends and family. Most of them had tried the products. There were a few who didn't, but you know, they trusted that it's good. So we got the, we got the review there. Another thing with what we did, we just shipped some products to say, um, um, less known celebrities or, um, athletes and like try this product for one month and then write an article, what you think about it. And usually when people get free products, they don't want to give you a bad review back. So it it was most often it was better. It was better than worse. 
And uh, so, so those were the ways we were trying to build the trust in the beginning before there was no one else. Um, no one else, um, they, will, they weren't like a proper review apps back then. Um, so it was very simple e-commerce business. What else? Also, that was very difficult that we were at the uh, bring of bankruptcy almost all the time because like having, having most of the money went to the stock. I didn't get any salary for the first two years. And when, if the stock didn't sell well, we were in trouble. Um, and one thing what we did, for example, it was like we, we, we were noticing we have like two, max three more weeks of um, cash, in, uh, cash left and something needs to be done. Um, so we decided that we're going to use that money to do something totally different that should work. And we were thinking, what can it be? And we decided, let's do, let's do a blender. Because uh, most of our customers are in the health, health and wellness field, and they do smoothies. And the, the major blender back then was Vitamix. It costed like $1,500. And that's an expensive investment for many people. So what we did, we, I basically sourced another factory that does a similar kind of blenders. And, and we got the samples, tested them out, and it seemed to be pretty good. And we decided, okay, let's, let's do a beautiful design for this. And it's, it's a high-tech blender, a lot of power. We call it gizmo because, you know, the, <laughs> uh, because when you put it water there, it's, it turns into a monster. So it was four sigmatic. Uh, it was actually back then it was four sigma foods gizmo, FSF gizmo. And uh, everything went well. We have a few influencers who promoted them. Um, and we made a lot of revenue and we were like, okay, this is going to be the new business to like, okay, we do mushrooms, but we also do high quality, you know, um, where that comp uh, people can use to improve their well-being. until very soon. We noticed that a lot of those blenders start breaking down. Um, you know, first one customer told us like, it's, it's, you know, there's something with wrong with the blender. It doesn't work anymore. Then, then a second, then a third one, all, all of a sudden we notice, oh gosh, there's a lot of customers complaining about the blenders. So it turned out the sample we got wasn't exactly the same than the production at the, uh, the, the actual production. Uh, so, so the, the sample was some kind of like really well built, but when they start mass producing the factory, uh, it was it was slightly less high quality, and and we had an agreement that uh, in this case that like if there is a certain per percentage is go um, uh, turns unviable or broken, then they have to reimburse us. Uh, so I start calling the factory up and like telling them like okay you know we have this like what five percent of all these blenders we sold are now breaking down. So I, based on our contract, you need to pay for us. And they stopped answering my calls and the emails. So what I had to do is I just flew in. I, I just flew in and sat their office until they actually paid me. Um, and this, the city is also, it's, it's funny. China is a funny country. It's, it's like, the city is called Tishu Shi. It's a, it's a small 2 million people town in between Hangzhou, Shanghai, and Ningbo. Uh, it, 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 there is nothing there except factories making blenders. It's like the whole city is dedicated building blenders. And I was sitting in one of these factories and telling them like, okay, you need to pay me this much money now in US dollars. And they're like, no can do. We can pay you in RMB, the local Chinese money. And, and the local Chinese money is the RMB, the yuan, Chinese yuan. Yeah, there is, there's a law, at least back in the days there, there was a law that you can't, you can't um, take more than 6,000 yuan out from China. Otherwise, it's smuggling money out of the country. And they were giving me a few hundred thousand of those local monies. And, 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 and I was thinking like, okay, so I have two options. I leave the money here or I smuggle them to Hong Kong. And I was like, if I leave them here, the company will go down. If I smuggle them to Hong Kong, there's a chance that I may go down. Uh, and I was like, uh, 
maybe I'll just smuggle them to Hong Kong. Uh, so I like I, I walked from Shenzhen to Hong Kong across the border. I was sweating, my hands were shaking, <laughs> and I was thinking like, if if they now get me, it's gonna be it's it's gonna be end of me. I'm gonna be in some kind of uh, you know unknown uh, prison camp, you know, just doing something like pro- I don't I don't know what. Luckily, that didn't happen. I got to Hong Kong and, you know, then I start basically depositing the money to several different Hong- Bank of China's because Bank of China is the only bank who can actually take Chinese yuan. And I didn't want to just give too many of those in one go. Otherwise, they start asking questions. So the next month, I was just walking around uh, Hong Kong in different Bank of China's depositing a few hundred yuan's uh, at a time. Well, so that kind of things, you know, those things are, you know, those if those things that you can expect, uh, I guess they are the most difficult things, you know. How did you decide the first market? How, how did you try to reach the customers? You know, those important decisions. You are in, in Asia, you are in Hong Kong. Did you, did you talk the local market? Did you talk some European market? Did you straight away go to the U.S.? Why did you choose the approach you did? Uh, we decided to go to Finnish market at first, and and uh, since the first day, the US was our main uh, like the goal. Like we want to get to the US market because if you make something big there, uh, it's gonna go global. Or it's gonna be actual big. Like if you big in Europe, it's like it's nice, but when you big in US, everybody knows you, and you actually make a bigger impact. But we understood that we didn't have the knowledge how to get there. We don't even know how to make actual physical products, especially food products. Um, and then also Finland back in the days in 2010, it was, um, I would say, kind of a hotspot for cutting edge natural products. All the like pakurika, but the chaga mushroom was, was already in the certain uh, health and wellness bubble, really big thing. So people knew the products and we had our own network here. So we thought we're probably going to get a pretty good uh, market here in Finland uh, so that we can, it can sustain us and we can expand. And the next uh, step in the plan was the UK market. It was kind of like the first English-speaking country, but still in Europe. So it's kind of easy to get there. And after UK, we were thinking, OK, we want to go to the, um, uh, North America. But U.S. is kind of a, it's, it's like, you know, Finns play hockey. So it was kind of like a NHL, the toughest place to get in. So how about if we go to Canada first? They are polite. They're nice people. So let's go there and learn the North American way in slightly less competitive and more friendly environment. And that's what we did. And once we were in, in Canada, it was easier to expand to U.S. And that was basically the rationale, rationale. And we did have, like, we were also selling in Sweden and Germany and France. And I think actually the second market, market was Ireland because Mikael was working at Google in Ireland back in the days. So it was, it was easy for him to get products there. And we had a few shops in, in, in Hong Kong as well. And there were like a random shops. I think there was someone from Slovenia, I guess, just asking like, can they, can they resell us? And I was like, yeah, sure, you can. It just sounds better. Like we have, a, we have a 20 countries selling, uh, like our products are sold in 20 countries. In reality, there is one shop in Slovenia selling our products, but hey, it's still a country. So what was the strategy? Uh, you were directly selling to then reaching out for the customers or you were targeting like uh, you said those who are actually uh, uh, using the blenders as well so it was uh, particular really aware customers or was it like you were looking for distributors or uh, what was uh, the idea? We were we were using in some countries we were using distributors um, then there were countries we were just selling D2C online, D2C online, and, and, and in some countries we were selling directly to resellers. But main customer was these, you know, people who really know their health and wellness products at first. So like we knew that that's the easiest customer for us. And those are the people who are spending a lot of money for uh, health products. But we all the time we wanted to, the, the whole mission was to democratize medicinal mushrooms. So we wanted to 
as many people know about them and, and get benefits out of them. So what we did, we had a we had a, a lot of these people who were sampling the products in different shops. At, at one point in Finland, I think we had 20 or 30 people who were for free sampling products, our products for customers in different stores, just because they like our mission and they, they really thought that medicinal mushrooms are the next big thing, which I still believe they are. Um, and um, um, yeah, so that way there, there were a lot of people helping us and, and like basically uh, sharing the message and le letting people to try products. What were the channels people were sharing? Instagram was already existing at the time. Uh, was it Facebook, Instagram, email, word of mouth, you know, just uh, in real life type of way in, in events? Or it was a mix of them? It was, it was a mix. It was uh, Facebook. Instagram wasn't that big of a thing in terms of marketing, if I remember correctly. Facebook was bigger back then. But we were, we were using influencers. So we were already then before the influencer thing was a thing. Uh, we were we were basically doing collaborations in different countries. These people who are very well known in their own health and wellness bubbles, and that was one of my, our main um, main sources source of revenue. And later on, you know, it, the same strategy expanded with Tim Ferriss and Joe Rogan and Ben Greenfield and these bigger names. But uh, back then, it was just micro-influencers in their own bubbles. What about the lessons you learned from Finland and the island and these first places? And did they actually apply to the other markets you went? So did you actually figure out the playbook? Or was there anything you could actually really like using the more difficult markets or bigger markets like the US then? Um, honestly, it's... Um... Still, when we were expanding to other countries, it was kind of an organized chaos and we were quite opportunistic. Um, I guess one of the learning points was just be persistent. Um, like very practical things. A lot of times we get our products into a health and, health and wellness store and uh, they are excited about the product and then it's run out, uh, it's out of stock and no one orders more even though they like the products and customers like the product. But, you know, the, the retailer has 2,000 different products on their shop. So they just, you know, can't focus on all of them. So what we had to do is basically follow up all the customers all the time. That was one major learning point during that time. But mainly it was still the first four, four years. It was basically organized chaos where we're just expanding and trying to trying to use duct tape wherever we can. How did you figure out the distribution, the logistics as well? Because that could be also there are different uh, regions. They have their duties. Did you ship all the products? Did you have warehouses somewhere? How, how did that work out? <laughs> that, that, was, that was a part I actually learned a lot. Uh, I didn't know much about the um, global logistics and the duties. Before that, I knew like if I order something, I need to pay duties, but I didn't really understand how the whole thing works from the um, brand perspective. Uh, we had a one big um, issue for us in the early days was when we shipped the products to Finland, we had a warehouse in Finland, which was one of our colleagues' um, home. <laughs> so so um, every time we shipped the products to Finland, the Finnish customs took, uh, took it aside took samples, um, just test, testing the products. Does it include what it claims it includes? And it sounds like it's nothing, but it, it actually is. Because when the customs are te tr testing something, they actually take the products and ship them to Scotland, which is the European Union laboratory where they test everything. And it's, it's there for two to three weeks. And then it comes back. So all that time, our, our stock is just sitting at the customs. And when the results come back, which they always came clean, it includes exactly what it should. And we have to pay 1,000 or you know, 1,500 euros for the lab test. So it's like hour to, hours to pay. And it wasn't because that's supposed to be a random testing. 
and and it wasn't really random because every single patch we shipped to Finland uh, got tested. So at one point we did, decided we need to do something about it. Like I mean, like we can't change the customs because the customs is who they are and they do their job. But what can we do? And we figure out since this is a European Union and back then UK was still part of the European Union. So we were like, how about if we ship the products to UK, uh, use the, um, the British custom and, and then ship there to Finland. And that turned out to be a really good idea because uh, in, in the UK, you don't have any VAT or import tax for tea products. And our products just happen to be tea products. So we, we saved that money and then we got the products to Finland and it was more affordable, it was faster and everything went much smoothly. And that was the time we actually set up the first subsidiary because the first, the original company was in Hong Kong. But in, in order to import to UK, we had to have a UK company. So then we decided, okay, let's have a subsidiary in UK. And that's, that's the, the corporation. That's how the corporation started. And how, how did we end up to the Tim Ferriss situation? Did you, did you were already in Canada or you, you were already having something in the US? We were already in. We were already in Canada. We were already in U U.S. Uh, we didn't have much of things going on in U.S., but there were basically Tero and I think Mikael both. They were just traveling around uh, U.S. and meeting different um, retailers. And um, I don't know if it happened before or after, but we got approved to Axel Foods um, Accelerator pro Program. Um, so then the, the part of the team starts staying in the New York. Um, through that program, we got introduced to some of the biggest distributors in the health and wellness um, industry. So we got big distributors in the, in the US. And I think it was around the same time, there was a lot of things happening at the same time. And then the team ferries happened and things started expanding big time. But it was basically just footwork. People, we were just uh, going from store to store, meeting people, trying to have them stock our products, and then meeting influencers and trying to meet people who can promote us at the same time. Do you remember where the difference is between marketing and selling in Europe uh, versus in the US? So was it basically the same approach you already did in the Finnish market and, and, and then it, it worked out? So. Um, I don't remember back then, but now that you ask me, I would say the big difference is uh, in in Europe you are actually uh, educating and telling, and in the US it's more direct marketing. It's just like buy this, buy this, buy this, and in Europe it's like, well, you should buy this because it's good. This is a slight nuances, but I think it's uh, more direct. Uh, more fast-paced in the US. How about the branding? Where does the name come from and how did you decide? You already mentioned that you, you wanted to do something differently. You wanted to have it more like a food and beverage category. Mm. What was the process and, and did, you, did you learn or was it uh, along the way or was it something you sort of figured out early on that this is how I want to be, this is, this is you know, what, what, what looks good and this is the way I want to do it? Well, original name was Luonto Life, uh, which is uh, uh, Finnish Luonto means nature and life. So we wanted to combine some Finnish elements and we thought that would be a good idea. And we, we very soon we noticed, especially in Ireland, that was actually the first English speaking country uh, before the UK, um, that people didn't know how to pronounce it. Uh, they, they were just like, what is this? And if you can't pronounce, pr pronounce it, you don't remember it. And if you can't remember the brand, well, that's a bad brand. Uh, so very soon we decided to, I think it was like weeks after we launched the brand, we were like, okay, so as soon as we're done with the stock, we have to find a new name. And, and this new name came when um, Tero was uh, living in Switzerland and his colleague who was working at CERN uh, told him that there was explaining like these medicinal mushrooms, these are, you know, um, like the best of the best. Like you have only a few, few, few uh, food products in the world that are as nutrient dense and as medi medicinal as, 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 um, 
um, medicinal mushrooms. And then the guy, like his friend said, like, oh, those are like four Sigma foods. Like, like, what do you mean four Sigma foods? Well, in, in standard deviation, if you have, say, X amount of food products and you have 20, the best out of them, he basically just calculated it's roughly four Sigma foods. Like, out of the 100,000 foods, top 20 or top 100 is four Sigma. And there was, like, oh, that's a good idea. And he presented us that one. It's like slightly nerdy, slightly engineerish, uh, a bit Finnish. Uh, and we're like, yeah, let's do it. Four Sigma food is good. And, and we decided to go with that. I was like, that's a good story. And then in the US, when we got to Axel Foods program, very soon there, the people were saying that, actually, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure if it was Axel Foods or another investor. But, uh, you know, they just ask us, like, Four Sigma Foods, but you sell beverages. Like, yeah, well, that's a good product, uh, <laughs> good point, like, you know. And then the company turned into Four Sigmatic. Like, only, only less syllables, easier to remember. You didn't have the food there anymore, since it was a beverage company anyway. What about the message and, and the store? For example, now, I understand you're not part of Four Sigmatic uh, actively at the moment, but the, the YouTube video, which is the, the company trailer in the website, is actually quite funny, the story, and it's, it's like the Finnish humor. And and uh, was that part of the, the package as, as well, you know, when you changed and, and decided that, okay, the US needs a bit different approach? No, since the early days, we've had um, quite innovative way of looking at the product Packaging, for example, we've always had in the first product we had, there was when you open it up inside, you have some text about mushrooms, about Finland. There was like this small business card where there was a photo of me saying like, hey, thank you for starting to invest in your health and wellness. We believe the medicinal mushrooms are the best in the world and like signature. It's like trying to make the customer experience as good as possible. And even now, when you open the package, even the, the, you have this same idea. There's like a little bit about Finland. There's a little bit about, about products. And it's like, you, you just want to see like, what else can I find from here? And, and so incorporating the finishness in the brand was um, important since the, since the first day. That's why the Luanta Life name, which didn't work, but you can do it otherwise as well. And, and, and the try black dark finnish humor is also a good way to do it yeah the company was actually in hong kong and and the products were shipped from hong kong so so it was just basically the the roots of the of the founders which is yeah. the marketing yeah. plant exactly exactly all right so what happened then uh, was it 2014 you left uh, for sigmatic uh, why was that and what did you do next um i had a major burnout um, that was caused by many different reasons, but it got in so bad that I couldn't, if I got WhatsApp message, I, like my heart rate went up to 170 heart rates per minute, um, a beats per minute, and I just couldn't function anymore. And the reasons behind the, that was that I wasn't really honest to myself. I wasn't really honest to my colleagues in a way that I was, um, I had too many responsibilities and I wasn't able to say to people, my colleagues that are like, this is too much for me because I had this feeling that I, I need to do all of these things. Originally I was being the CEO, I was, I was doing the product development, I was doing the finance, I was doing the operations. Well, at one point we got a few interns to help with the operations as well, but mainly there were too many hats for me to um, wear and it became too heavy for me. And there, there should have been a moment when I had just, you know, um, put the brake on it to say like, no, this is, we can't continue like this. I, I can't continue like this. And I should have done it because I was the CEO of the company, but I couldn't do it. I was, I felt like I, I felt that I, there was like a partly guilt and partly shame. The, the feeling that I, I need to be doing more, I need to contribute more. And, and then, you know, just I went to point of no return. 
and it got so bad that just I couldn't, you know, all the whole house of cards that I was holding was just quickly falling apart. And then, you know, we had to do quite, quite quick decisions, like how to continue from here. And then the decisions were that, well, first of all, Terra will take the company and start leading it. And we will hire new people to take the other parts, what I was doing before. And that was, we hired the like CFO to take this, the business side. One of the interns who, who, who was with us, he started, you know, taking part of the uh, operations and, and, um, and Terra took the CEO tasks. So there was basically three people, uh, three people um, taking the tasks I was doing before, which means that I wasn't really, you know, no one can do well three people uh, work. And that was, you know, uh, I know that, uh, you know, the CFO was actually fixing the financial side quite a long time after me. So yeah, I wasn't doing that well, that side, but you know, it was, it was, um, I think it was a fortune for the for the company actually because I was really good at um, I had a vision I was good at you know putting the pieces of puzzle together um, but I wasn't fit to run the company so it, I think it went exactly like it was supposed to go that I just basically put the foundation there and Dara who is really determined he, he's super smart he is like I, I I knew that he can scale it where it should go. So in a way, it went exactly like it was. It was long time coming. I mean, like my burnout with the with my mindset I had back in the days, it would have come sooner or later. Was it your decision to actually that you figured finally that okay, this this cannot go on, or was it the other founders say that okay, uh, it's enough? You know, you know. You, you I know. think the other founders should have said it before, and it, it happened only when I couldn't continue. It was me basically just dropping the tools like can't do it anymore. I, I just can't do it. Now, now we need to do something. There's too much. So there was a, um, there was a level of, uh, there was actually lack of communication, uh, from my part to others. And there was also, I guess, lack of noticing the situation from other, other founders to me. Obviously it's pretty, pretty difficult to notice because we were a remote team. I was in Hong Kong, uh, Terra was in, uh, either New York or um, uh, West Coast. And there was a Marcus who was in France or in Finland, Mikael who was in Finland, uh, Mikael who was in UK and sometimes in the US. So we hardly ever see each other. So it's like the communication is even more important in those situations. And I couldn't, I, I wasn't able to do it well enough so that other people would have noticed that like it's, everything is not okay now. Like if you're working 16 hours per day, then everything is not okay. What about the signals now reflecting back that, you know, you should have, or you could have now I'm thinking uh, other people who may actually be, or, or will become in that situation so that you could actually pick it up earlier that it doesn't go as, as far as in your case. Radical honesty. I mean, radical honesty yourself and to others. It's so important that you can just look, look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not equipped to do this or I need someone else to do I need help or uh, or 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 from the the other colleagues perspective like telling uh, straight but with loving kind matter that you know you're not probably doing exactly the way you should be doing and we need to make some changes and also making the changes while they're still small because the longer you wait, the bigger the demon will become and the more difficult it is to conquer it. So, so catch them early. Those you also the mentioned that obviously things. there was this financial situation and, and there was always difficulties in the business to, to grow it and, and, and keep it above mm. the water. Uh, are there some objective, if you will, uh, signals like you didn't take any days off or you were every day working the 16 hour days or something that which doesn't take too much of a self-reflection to, to figure out that, okay, this is not normal. Yeah, well, lots. I was, I was in this kind of like a, a movers and shakers mentality, like overachiever, like you just need to do more, need to do more. It's, I was, everything that I was trying to do, it was just like overachieving. Like, you know, you, like you should, like, if you don't have balance between your work 
and other parts of your life. Work is your life as well, but other parts of your life, then it's not sustainable in long term. Um, you need to have other stuff too that are actually balancing your uh, working work lifestyle. For me, it was ultra running. So doing these 50 to 100 kilometer running races in, in nature, in, in, in trails. And that's not sustainable either. Like if you if you're doing this like like working long hours and then you also running long hours. So when do you have time to you know uh, take it easy? So or sleep. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it's it's um, in a way I would say um, yeah, it's it it just needs to. You just need to be honest to yourself like you know like for in my case i was running away myself in a way there were like some internal anxiety about xyz maybe it was because i wasn't performing well enough on my opinion maybe i was performing well enough uh, other people's perspective but on my own self harsh self-criticism was like i wasn't doing well enough i i need to do more and then i'm running uh those internal dialogues and feelings away to trails as well so there's no way i wanted to kind of like reflect and look at myself and how am i actually doing and what can i do differently so how did you end up running oh it was... there was also a story about that and and it was it beautiful hong kong scenery which maybe not <sighs> too many people know if they haven't been there that just think that it's just like a urban urban place but uh, there's more to hong kong as well oh yeah hong kong is a beautiful place it's a uh, um i do love the city actually i do love the nature i don't like the city that much but it's also it's also nice but 70 percent of hong kong is you know nature you have beautiful mountains these like subtropical forests amazing beaches just like hidden beaches you can run a trail one or two hours you end up this beach that there's no one else there and you just see ocean in front of you and mountains behind you and it's beautiful so and that was like nature i've always loved nature a lot so that was one of the reasons and another reason was that it was a balancing act like it actually was a balancing act to my my work life first so i was doing short runs and short walks in the nature but very quickly my you know the distance started getting longer i was starting to run faster and then i end up meeting these trail runners who are actually doing long distance like super long distances and they asked me to join them i was like yeah why not like you know sounds fun and then all of a sudden i'm starting to compete like the first race was 50 kilometers and i did pretty well i was like yeah I like it. I like winning. I wasn't. I didn't win, but I was doing well on my own opinion. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do more of this. And then I start doing more races. Then I start training for the races, and then I end up being in like Happy Valley Race Course, which is a horse track, like one kilometer race course. And I was doing the in the walls in in summer when that was like thirty five degrees hot, and I was I had a headache, and it wasn't fun at all. And there was this like. Uh, inner dialogue like there was this voice in my head asking like you know Mika why are you doing this this is not what you're signed up for I was like yeah it's not actually and I stopped and I didn't practice anymore I still had one race coming in a few months later and I was like well I have the tickets I'm gonna go there but I'm probably not gonna run and and I did run and, and I did I did run well I was I would, that was actually the best race I ever did. It was like out of 1,000 something participants, I was 22nd total. And I was like, yeah, this is a good way to stop running. And I haven't done any race since then. I remember you were also mentioning, was it uh, actually what you did after the Four Sigmatic? You started another company and started to do another thing. You were also testing the products and, and then you went running and the trail running oh. started to have another another meaning i don't know how graphic we need to go but was that the same period or was uh, it already that, earlier? that was earlier that was with, with four sigmatic because you know because i was doing the product development for four sigmatic so i was um 
I would I had these different mushroom powders and herbal powders and mixing them together and trying how they taste and what are the effects like empirical empirical effects. Um, and there was a few things that were funny uh, as well. Like we had this sports herbs blend. So you had these uh, uh, herbal supplements that are supposed to increase your endurance and sports performance. And, uh, and uh, I had been developing the product for quite some time. And I had this running race coming up. And, and, uh, and I was like, now it's the time for me to test it up. And, and uh, the, like five minutes before the race, I, I just took huge amount of that blend and 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 uh, and two two three minutes before the race my stomach started crumbling and i was like oh gosh and i was like i need to go and then i just run to bathroom do my thing come back to the race and uh basically one minute before the race starts and and and, and start going and i i I was able to do half the distance of the whole race. It was 21 kilometers. So I did like 10 kilometers, had a terrible headache. I couldn't even walk uh, properly and I had to leave it there. So there I learned that like, you know, more is not always better. Better is better. And then we end up developing that product, but we end up having slightly uh, smaller amount per one dose than what I had during that race. It's like, you know, it, and that's uh, that's a good example. Like many of these things, like um, you know the, how the Paracelsus said that everything is poison and nothing is poison, but the dosage makes it so. So that was a good example. Like the same thing that actually boosts your endurance can take your take you out from the race. I just had it too much. Yeah. So after for Sigmatic, uh, you were burnt out, but you didn't stop. No, How long no. did it take and what did you do next? And, and when did you actually fully stop to do, do stuff? I think I was kind of on hiatus for two weeks when I was thinking like, what should I do next? I didn't think what happened. I was thinking, what should I do next? Like, I, I need to do something. I need, I need to prove to people that I can do stuff. And I ended up founding a company that was selling uh, all kinds of health and wellness products online. And, um, as you know, everything from nuts to, you know, natural toothpaste to dietary supplements. Uh, my idea was that it was kind of like a Amazon, but for health and wellness products in Asia. And, uh, it was, it was doing pretty okay at first. I was running the company for two years until the burnout that I didn't actually heal from just took me down. There were like many things that happened, but basically I couldn't continue anymore. I was running it for, let's say, two years, and then I had to stop and look at the things that what happened during the Four Sigmatic. First of all, just, you know, if you get a burnout, you need to rest. You just can't continue. Even the mind is probably able to, you know, push you through, I was doing the whole two years and it was like a maniac mentality. I like just do things, do things. I, I collected 2,000 different products uh, for my online store. I was managing all those products by myself. I was shipping the products out. I was uh, writing, the, writing the product descriptions for all those 2,000 products and uh, doing the marketing, everything. And my idea was like, I'm going to learn every single thing that there is to do with this business. And then I'm going to get a bigger funding and hire the people. And when I was starting to do the funding, I realized I can't do it. It's like, well, many things happened. Couldn't continue. Company went to bankrupts. And uh, uh, that was the time when I decided like, okay, now it's actually me, my time to look into the mirror and see what's going on. And then I decided to move to Finland. I moved to Orvo, which is this beautiful medieval town, one hour from Helsinki. I, I had this wooden house where I was just doing gardening, um, heating a wooden stove and fireplace, and really trying to think, like reflect, well, like what happened during the past almost seven, eight years? Like what were the things I did well? There were a few of those. And what were the things that I didn't do that well and why did those happen and that period just took two years didn't do anything 
but eventually something happened. So what was the next move? You you didn't become like a Japanese would say salary man. You 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 went back to your roots and became an entrepreneur again. Yeah, that was a, that was a time I was actually really thinking hard if I actually do want to be an entrepreneur. Like my both both parents were, and it was a natural um, path for me. But then you know all the stress, all the things you know related to entrepreneurship. I don't know if I want to do if I want to put myself into that. But eventually, if there's a good enough idea, you just sort of sort of kind of like move towards towards that direction, and that happened to myself as well. So a good friend of mine, Jukka, who is also an entrepreneur, he, he had this um, chocolate company called Goodio, and he he's. His daughters have, daughter has some major issues. Um, first of all, she's a special need child, and uh, which is like no one really knows what what exactly is going on with her. Like they they've gone all kinds of different experts, and everyone just everybody just said like we don't know something's going on. Probably it's neurological. We don't know. But at one time they went to this um, functional medicine doctor to see if there is anything that that person can do. And they took all the blood tests and uh, checked all the body vitals and said, like, your child is uh, desperately uh, nutrient depleted. And they recommended 16 different supplements. And uh, the 16 different supplements is very difficult for a seven-year-old child who is not even able to eat regular food that, that well not to mention swallowing supplement capsules and pills. And um, Jukka was very frustrated about that. You know, you know, even the doctor, it costed 1,000 euros and there's like little, not, no help, except like, yeah, something needs to be done, but that's something you can't do it. So we start thinking if there could be any possibility to, you know, can we find a solution to fix this problem? And we were, we were looking for it like half a year uh, thinking in many different approaches until we we, we found this microencapsulation technology, which is it's actually quite old technology used in uh, food industry and medical industry to capsulate ingredients inside this layer that protects the you know the active ingredients inside, and and that technology turned out that you can actually make certain ingredients tasteless. You can improve the shelf life. You can improve the bioavailability, which means that uh, if you eat something, the more actually get absorbed into your body. So you get more benefits out of it. We're like, this sounds pretty good. And we were wondering if we can actually use this technology with, with dietary supplements. Because if we can, we can make this microencapsulated powder. So it's encapsulated on microscopic level. It looks like powder that doesn't taste anything. But you have these active ingredients that Yukka's daughter, Taimi, is able to then take. And since the idea was pretty good and we thought that this could be actually a bigger thing. And, and I'm usually, I'm still kind of a guy when I get a good idea. Okay, let's go. Let's start executing it. And Yukka was more like, well, let's think about it. What could be the like 11 star product for this? Like, you know, if, if the five star is the best, what would be the 11 star? And we start thinking, they're like brainstorming dif different options. And we came up with the personalized nutrition. So with this service, we can actually make you one product you take once a day. And it has everything your body needs. And even include some of the functions you may want. And it was like, this is good. This is what we want to do. And that actually inspires us. So, but we thought like that's a slightly too big uh, chunk for us immediately. So let's do something first before. And we decided to create three different functional nutrition blends that have certain certain functions. So one improves your sleep quality, another one improves your immunity, and third one improves your focus blend. And and we, the, the, that's what we've been doing so far. And and the main goal, the mission is the will basically eradicate the nutrient related diseases from the world which is hopefully we can get so at least close so you started with the finnish market first then the playbook was uh, again go to the us so can you walk us through what happened uh, what worked what what didn't work 
what were the struggles, but now you already have a lot of knowledge from the Four Sigmatic, so you, I would assume that you can uh, expedite things, so it's, it's quicker to do things, but still the market has also changed. It has matured, uh, the, the tools and the competition has changed as well, so it's not like uh, copy-pasting the past. It's not copy pasting, but it's it, it it was certainly much easier to develop the products. Uh, we have a, a more resources around us. I, I knew what mistakes not to take. Uh, I had a clear understanding what the product will look like, and our idea because also the U.S. company before the Goodio they main market is also the U.S. So we both have been even though during the Four Sigmatic I wasn't directly. I was doing some sales overseas over the phone to US, but I wasn't mostly in the US market myself, but I had still understanding how the market works and there was some network and, you know, same with Yucca. So we thought like, since instead of going to Finnish market, let's go to the US market first. It's a bigger market and we know how it mainly works in this field. And everything went pretty well. We developed the products quite quickly. Normally, product development can take one to two years. So we did it in half a year, which was really good during the time, especially when the, the that was 2020 early. I would say it was right before the pandemic. And then we sent the products, huge, amount of pro, huge amounts of products to US. We had a warehouse in Chicago. We ship lots of products there and start, you know, selling. Uh, we start about to launch the products, and one day after the launch, Shopify, the platform we were using, they told us that uh, you can't use our payment gateway because your products are considered pseudo pharmaceuticals, which means that anything that is vitamin, mineral, amino acids, or herbal products are considered pseudo pharmaceuticals and they are not allowed on their platform of the gate payment gateway so we had to find a new payment gateway which we did quite quickly um obviously there are many different options so it's not that difficult to find a new one um then uh, everything's well, okay things are pretty okay now so let's start um advertising and and this was already now after the pandemic and it's we couldn't promote any of our products so facebook and google basically banned not banned but they didn't uh, approve our our advertisements and we couldn't figure out why well i do figure out now one of the products is called immunity blend so it can you can consider it as a health claim that is not allowed in certain things but the problem was that we couldn't know what was the actual reason because the either of the platform platforms weren't giving us any particular reasons they just tell uh, told us that uh, your products are against our community guidelines and there's nothing you can do about it but we really wanted to do the u.s market because the, the potential was much bigger there and um we tried for half a year how to do it there we were talking with different brands different company like marketing agencies like what exactly can we do and all of them were like we don't know no idea like uh, technically all of your products at least the focus blend and a sleep blend should be allowed to sold there but you know many of these things are uh, there's an algorithm behind it and if if the algorithm goes the wrong direction there there may be no way to turn it back we tried to have a new facebook page as well but that didn't work either so after half a year and a lot of cash burned we decided to let's just ship the products back to Finland and and um, sell in, in Finnish market. At least we have a personal connections here we can use to to uh, to get some revenue. And uh, we had the same problems for a while in the in Finland with Facebook and Google as well. So we need to just figure out something like what can we do? Okay, we can't use those. But like almost the only way to market these days is through these platforms. So instead of promoting our own products, we created these free webinars and start, you know, giving added value, added value to customers. One webinar was um, 
um, sleep. How do, how can you improve your sleep with free techniques? Another one, how you can, how can you improve your stress, like lower your stress levels and manage your stress levels in free techniques, and then just plug in our own products at the end of it. And that work actually, actually really well, better than I expected. Why did you use influencers? Like you mentioned that that was in the early days of Four Sigmatic, you were using uh, heavily influencers. Why that didn't work in the US market? We had a, we started it too late. Um, we were actually, we, uh, the major mistake we did, this is like by far the biggest mistake we did with the launch in the US, that we banged with two major influencers in the US. Like we had, Kind of initially agreed that this is how we're gonna do it with them, and uh, we we basically put all our eggs into those baskets, and then they decided to um, back down for for whatever reason. They had uh, agreements with other brands, and they couldn't do it with us, and then we were basically left with nothing. And that time, our team was too small to handle all the issues that came with um, that pandemic that basically increased the costs of logistics we, we were shipping the products all over the uh, world to for production and production to us so uh, basically we we're running short of cash uh, we just didn't have enough um, team members there's like a let's say we have too many projects and not enough time like we're, we were too ambitious and not focused enough that we were actually able to do certain things that that's basically that bad management in a way so direct to consumers dtc startups what can you tell them what are the the ways to do marketing and sales and what have you learned and i think you also have something special you know about finnish market mm. focus that's the first thing that what I especially learned with Timey, like focus what matters. It's very easy to start doing all these different things that are not really uh, essential, um, but just having a, having a sharp focus on the major major uh, KPIs and um, metrics, and actually do do what it needs to be done. Um, D2C brands. Well, you mentioned that it's really hard to actually, in some cases, well, it's actually costly, even if you if you can do the Google and and Facebook uh, marketing. So yeah. is, is the influencing still the way to go? You mentioned these webinars. What are the hacks or, or what do you think are the best ways for those who don't have a lot of cash in the beginning well, to, to, to get to the it's consumers? All, it's always easier to if you can give value to customers, that's always the easiest way. Uh, for example, the webinar, what we did, because um, I was I was looking for different ways to market. We didn't have much of cash anymore left, and um, the normal Facebook marketing didn't work for us. We that that just didn't work for us. So I was thinking, what if we do webinars? And um, I went to look for the uh, metrics for like what are the how much is how much one Facebook lead costs in the US? And it was about eight dollars. And then I compared it to Finnish numbers, and well, there is no cost per lead um, uh, benchmarks in Finland. So I, I I estimated with the Facebook CPA US compared to F Facebook CPA in Finland, and in Finland the price was half of the US. So I assume that CPL, the cost per lead in Finland, is also roughly half of the US. So that should have been something like three to three point five to four euros. And we start doing marketing. That's like we can do that if we can get enough uh, leads turn into customers. That's going to be really good for us. And and we I, I made this. It, it was actually a really good webinar about stress, how to manage stress especially in the time when people are stressed about pandemic and all these things it was very useful for a lot of people and start marketing it on facebook and our lead uh cost per lead was sometimes less than one euro but it was never more than two euros so it was most affordable way of marketing and getting leads 
because it's it's more important like one thing about d2c companies get leads you need a lot of leads in your own system whether it's a newsletter or whatever it is but you can't like really trust uh, you can't only solely rely on these platform platforms facebook and google because at any given day they can change their algorithms even if you can get uh, visitors or customers through them um they are still not your uh, they are not your customers until they have actually purchased. So if they come to your website, that doesn't matter. So you need to get leads. And the more affordable ways of getting leads you have, the better it is. And for us, the webinars, that was a phenomenal way of doing it. It's so cheap. And I haven't, I haven't even known any other ways of getting leads that affordably, any legal ways of getting leads that affordably than the Facebook leads with the webinars in Finland. It may not work in other, other countries, um, but I, I believe in smaller markets, like all the European markets, at least all the Scandinavian markets, I believe it works. Then you mentioned something about also that the payment methods, which was quite surprising. Can you, can you tell to the audience uh, how people tend to pay? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, okay, if, let's start with the US. Everyone use credit card. That's it. There is no other way of paying anything. And that's simple and that's clear. Well, when you come to Finland, 70% uh, of people pay bank transfers when they use online uh, e-commerce. And 20% are using mobile pay, which is this mobile app you can use to pay stuff. And only 10% um, or less are using credit cards. And it's, it's crazy because I use credit cards for everything. I mean, it's safer to use credit card. It's like, you know, if something goes wrong, you can get it back from the credit company. Um, but a lot and, of our And customers... you don't get it back, you know, if you do the, the, the wire transfer, basically, because it's, yeah, the no, bank doesn't no. do anything it's gone. about it. Yeah. yeah, it's gone. Like something happens, it's gone. You can't get it. Unless if it's a nice company you're working with, that they, they really value their customer support. But in technically... You have no guarantee of getting it back. And um, one thing we notice um, that, that I got those stats when I was talking with this uh, PayTrail, like Finnish Payment Gateway company, and they have these internal statistics they use. But I noticed that that's that's the that's the trend because we use this abandoned cart sequence to um, you know try to people who uh, add products to cart but haven't checked out to actually check out. And it's very standard. Um, like first you get this email, like, hey, you left this your card. Why don't you go and um, um, get them now? Um, and then there's a second one coming like a day later, like, okay, your card is gonna expire, expire in four hours, get it now. Or otherwise you don't have this card anymore left, which I don't understand why anyone should care because you can go and get the products later, but it still, it still works. Um, but what normal companies, other companies are not doing, as far as I know, um, what we are doing is we, we're having a third email, which looks very personal email. There's nothing, no edit, it, it, just a regular email where I'm asking the customer, um, it, and it looks like it's coming from me, uh, not from the company, but me as a, uh, as a CEO. And asking like, hey, I have a the, the subject line is I have two questions for you. I hope you can answer. And then I ask him like, let's say I noticed that recently you add products to your cart, but you didn't go to check out. And I'm I was just wondering if you're able to tell me like what were the reasons that you didn't check out, and what would it take for you to check out so that we can improve our service. And a lot of people are actually answering to this. I'm, I'm, every day I'm answering two or three emails of this. And by far, the most common thing is uh, you have only credit card option. I don't want to give my credit card numbers to anyone except Netflix and uh, Spotify and, you know, but like <laughs> anyone else. And, and that surprised, surprised me. Like, so what is your standard re reply? Is it, is it like, okay, here's the bank account number, please, you know, wipe the money immediately and, you know, we can ship the products. <laughs> usually, usually I'm telling that like, um, 
uh, either you can it really depends we actually stopped doing it because um, usually it, it it's it doesn't cover the time cost uh, we did it actually at first. Like we send we send an invoice. Uh, here you can pay. Send to this uh, uh, the bank bank number, uh, but it it doesn't work. It's just like too time consuming. You have to go to the bank account, check like okay, now they pay. Now you can sh ship it manually. It takes an hour to do that one thing. So not uh, not scalable, but um, uh, but yeah we could have like more payment options as well, obviously there are a few reasons like technical reasons we haven't had yet but you know it's a good thing to re uh, like when you're a d2c company always check what are the most common payment gate uh, payment options in certain country like germans use cash or like you know like when i was in hong kong i got this checkbook you know and i was like what is this like I, I, I have like vague recollections that people are using this, uh, that this exists in like a, the last century somewhere er, earlier part. And I actually called my father then like asked like, hey, you know, can you tell me how do I actually use this checkbook? And he's like, checkbook? I think I haven't used those since 80s. I don't remember. I guess you just put the number and, you know, uh, sign it and that's it. So, so different countries have different methods. What is your favorite word? Oh, I love etymology, like not the word, but I, lo I love the science of uh, words and the history of words. So there's a lot of words I like. Um, I think the words are almost like uh, their own entities and they evolve along the way. It's very, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I think in, in English language, I probably like inspiration because it comes from um, Latin words, uh, inhale. I believe that's in a Latin words, but the original word where it's kind of like inhale and the spirit. So you kind of like a inhale spirit or inhale God when you get the inspiration. So that's a beautiful word. Um, but in Finnish, I love the word harrastus. Uh, which means when you practice something, but in Finnish it's uh, because the word comes from uh, harras, which, which means uh, sacred. And and when you when you when you do that, when you practice, it's sacred for you. So it's 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 nice. And the the word that actually got me into uh, being interested in etymology was the Chinese word ziran, which means nature. But what it actually means is self-organizing system. So, so, and the, there are so many words. I, I have actually a list of words. When I when I get a new word, I just write it down and the meaning and the etymology of it. It's, I love them. Yeah. What is your least favorite word? Oh, don't think I actually have the least favorite word in a way but i would probably say war because the what's behind war is completely useless there's there's no need for that and usually the wars are fought by the people who are not actually related to the results of the war at, at all and it's just creating suffering and and uh, yeah it's just that that's the reason war yeah what turns you on, creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? I think helping others. If if I can, if I can in a way help someone, and there is a many different ways of helping people. It's like I, I considered, for example, four sigmatic is helping a lot of lot of lot of lot of lot of people to become healthier, and just by having that force going forward that 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 kind of that's great but it can also be if i can help my you know stepsister to do her homework and it, I, I can see that like she's enjoying it like, like she she appreciates the help and i can be a use for her 
then uh, that also great. That, that, that's also really, really, really great. Like helping others in bigger and smaller things. And I find all my companies are also about helping others. What turns you off? It cannot do attitude. It's like there's always like, no, it cannot be done. No, it's too difficult. And that's a good ex example. When I, w when I moved to Hong Kong and um, I went to there, this like Finnish association. They, they meet once a month, every, uh, uh, once every Friday in one pub. And when I moved there, I was like, well, I'm just going to go there and see, just meet the people, meet the other Finns. And I was 23, I think. And most of the people, they were these like, you know, people, expats who are working for Nokia, Coneo, one of these big companies, Mezzo and others. And, and just drinking beer there. Nothing wrong with drinking beer. But like when, when I got there and they asked me like, what are you going to do? Like, what are you doing here? And I'm super excited, like I, uh, trying to tell, oh, I have this idea. And I'm based in the traditional Chinese medicine. I understand that I understand it. And like, oh, we're gonna, I'm going to do this medicinal mushroom company. We're going to sell these great products for people. And they're like, oh, that's a stupid idea. It will never work. It's like, that's, yeah, yeah you're too young. I get like, if you have this kind of like bullshit being, or can't, can't do being, oh, I got all the, all the marks done. And then I was like, okay. I guess I don't need to come to another Finnish association <laughs> a gathering. And it was, it was the only one. No, I did went a, a, another time there too. But like, that was like, I, I don't like that. I like support. I don't like can't do it attitude. What is your favorite curse word? <sighs> I think it's perkele. It's it's powerful. It's an, it's also actually don't remember if it's um, um, the god of forest or is it the god of underworld in in, in the Finnish mythology. But I like I, it's a powerful word. And even the foreigners who don't know what it means when you say it, they're like, oh, okay, got it. <laughs> so I like that. What sound or noise do you love? Hmm. I like the sound of forest when you can hear the wind uh, making the sound with the trees and you can hear the birds chirping and in, in overall it's not only the one sound there but it's the whole symphony that happens in, in nature. What sound or noise do you hate? <laughs> um, uh, the sound of highway when you are in forest anywhere in, 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 in southern Finland and you can hear the birds but behind that you have this very low humming sound that comes from highways that are around you. I hate that. Can't stand it. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Uh, historian or archaeology. Archaeologist. I like, I like, I love ancient history, uh, Roman, Greek, um, Egyptian, even ancient Chinese history, all of that. It's super fascinating. I think they, they figure out something we haven't yet. Many of them, like even the philosophy, the sto stoic philosophy and you know, that all the, the whole, that thing, I would like to explore that more. What profession would you not like to do? Probably quite many. Mm. I wouldn't probably wouldn't like to be a um, accountant. I like numbers, but I I don't like them that much. I like to an analyze them, but I don't like to type them in. Yeah. If you could be a co-founder of any startup in any era, which one would you choose? Hmm. So for me, the st startup is not, um, it's not a thing itself. It's more about what you do. It's, it's like a tool to get something done. Um, so I guess 
in a way it would have been i don't know east indian trading company that was an interesting time i don't know it was uh, like you know exploring the new world and bringing tea and uh, spices back to uk and and uh I guess it wasn't the most ethical business at the end of the day. We found out later, but you know, that was the first major co cooperation in a way. And I guess it started pretty small, or maybe not. I don't know. I guess it was a monopoly. Any final yeah. words to the audience? It's good to live balanced life. Um, overachieving is not a thing. That's something I'm learning right now. And I'm, I'm shifting from the overachiever. I've been doing it the past six, seven years, but it's still a work in progress. And um, it's good to have these checks with yourself that asking you like, am I doing this? What, what's the in, in, intention, motivation for me doing this way and that way? And I think what we should in, in every aspect in our life is try to uh, strive for towards uh, balance, uh, whether it's our actions, whether it's our the results that are coming from it. So everything is about balance. So it's kind of like a pseudo um, deep stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Mikko, for the great talk. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Until next time.